Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you are interested in these programs, please join our membership. You can join by going to preservelincoln.org. Um, today is the 12th of a series of lectures with Jim McKee. Um, support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Please join me in thanking Speedway Properties for their generous support of the videotaping and other expenses associated with this series. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the, eight, in the 1870s. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J&L Lee Company a publisher of regional books. He has written over 1,000 articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. Um, he is on the, historic, the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. And he is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the 12th of a series of over 25 talks during the next couple of years. And the series is titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln and this is program number 12. Please join me, or Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Well, we're going to <clears throat> pick up today with the 1874 temperance movement, which was in February of 1874 at a time at which Lincoln had 18 saloons in the downtown area and 11 churches. And at that point in time, a man by the name of Reverend Henry T. Davis, who also wrote a pretty good history, uh, decided that the Methodist Church should have a temperance march against the saloons in the city of Lincoln. His idea was to form a group of women from his church, 21 women in fact, and to take them individually to each one of the saloons in the city to set up a prayer meeting um, and ask the people that were there to give up their sinful and idle ways, I guess. Um, 21 women gathered that day on the north side of the square, so it would be where the Lincoln Journal Star Building is today. Unfortunately, the first saloon which they're going to visit, which is about in the middle of the block on the north side of P Street, the owner had been forewarned that the ladies were coming, and so he had sort of issued an advertisement to all his customers that there would be free cigars and free beer, which put them in a rather interesting lubricated uh, manner for the day. So it was a smoke-filled room that they entered. They quickly set up their little stand, if you will, on one of the pool tables, sang a few hymns, uh, said a few prayers, and there were no converts. Uh, from there, however, they went to the building which we see here on the left side of the picture, which is on the southeast corner of 11th and P, which is now the old um, bus station, old Boomer's Printing Company, and now it is also, again, a saloon and restaurant. Uh, at that time, the little two-story building was a T. P. Quick, Turnus P. Quick, interesting name. His saloon was probably uh, one of the most popular saloons in the city of Lincoln. Uh, and a little bit later, we'll see in the next picture that they actually add on to the building and add another floor so that they can have a conference room, if you will, up, up top. Um, the ladies were met on the curb by a man whose name is E.E. E. Brown, who was an attorney in the city of Lincoln and also uh, the mayor of the city of Lincoln. And Mr. Brown and Mr. Quick urged the ladies to not go into the saloon, uh, but one of them did, nonetheless. Her name was Mrs. Ricketts, whose husband was also an attorney in the city of Lincoln. Uh, she went in and was properly, or promptly, I should say, picked up by the barkeep, a man by the name of Whipple, who did not squeeze her, but instead picked her up and threw her head first onto the wooden sidewalk outside, doing very little damage to the wooden sidewalk or Mrs. Whipple. However, uh, Mrs. Ricketts, excuse me, however, her husband was not amused. Uh, he quickly sued uh, the barkeep, uh, and she won the suit. She won $57.50. However, subsequently, the award was reversed, and she got nothing. 
Uh, at that point in time, they went after this unsuccessful attempt. They went to another saloon whose name I'm not sure of, but it was on O Street, on the south side of the street, someplace between 8th and 9th, probably about where later the uh, uh, Pepperberg Cigar Company would be located, somewhere is about in there. And interestingly enough, they went in, there was apparently not very many customers there, or not very many customers there. And the saloon keeper agreed to close the saloon, which he did shortly afterwards. And so they had one out of 18 they closed, but that was their only success. Uh, by 1909, there were 40 saloons uh, in the city of Lincoln, which, all of which were closed under the administration of Mr. Hardy, the mayor, who also had Hardy Furniture Company. Uh, who may, took Lincoln Drive for his two terms as mayor. And we, again, we don't visit the question again until the 18th Amendment comes up. This is the same building shortly afterwards, uh, T.P. Quick's pool room uh, that I mentioned before. He was also Lincoln's first fire chief in a manner of speaking. He was uh, the only paid member of the volunteer fire department at that time. He began in 1873, and he got a pretty good salary, $300 per year, uh, which went on until 1887, when finally we begin to think about having to do away with the volunteer fire department. The saloon itself became sort of a quasi-official headquarters for a lot of the fraternal organizations in town, where if you went to a fraternal meeting, then the evening after that meeting, you would repair to Mr. Quick's and go upstairs for a debriefing, if you will. Um, he was certainly probably the most successful of all the cities. Uh, and he was occasionally got into a little bit of trouble. He was sued a couple of times for riotous, disorderly, and indecent conduct and so forth. But uh, that was torn down just in fact, I think the next picture shows us uh, the last occupant of the building, which was uh, this grocery store. Next to it was the Sun Coffee Shop, but the building on the corner stood until it was torn down to make way for the uh, previous bus station building, which still stands there. <clears throat> Next building, this is from one of Otto Klima's many stereopticon slides, which he gave to the Historical Society probably about 35 years ago, and it shows the Douglas House Hotel, or the Commercial Hotel, or the Capitol Hotel, which was on the southwest corner of 11th and P. Uh, this was probably one of the least desirable downtown lots in the city of Lincoln. And we find that in 1869, the property changed hands three times before it's finally purchased by a man by the name of Dr. Scott, who builds just the very corner portion of the building as a drugstore. Uh, and as I think we talked before, it was very common for physicians, doctors, to also be the pharmacist. Because at that point in history, particularly in the Midwest where there's not great population, in order to have cash money, the doctor usually had to sell medicines. He would go out and do diagnoses and so forth for which he might receive, you know, a dozen eggs or some bacon or ham or a chicken, something like that. But almost all the doctors also carried with them uh, apothecary supplies so that they could get cash, which everybody needed to operate on. So he was also a apothecary as well as a physician. Um, in 1869, he built the building on the corner. And the reason it was so difficult a property to sell was because towards the middle of the block, there was then, as there were all over downtown Lincoln, uh, sort of what we'll call them like artesian wells or springs that brought water up. And it made this area uh, almost always quagmire so to dig your foundations or a basement were almost impossible. That's why it changed hands probably in 1869 before he was able to build his drugstore on the corner. Uh, it is said uh, that Dr. Scott leased out the upper floors of the building to a lady who ran another business which was completely unassociated with the drugstore downstairs. <coughs> but which proved to be rather profitable. In fact, at one point during maybe the first year, he noticed that the business upstairs was doing a whole lot better than the business downstairs. And so he added on to the building uh, and converted it, made it all into a hotel, which he cleverly called the Commercial House Hotel. Uh, it became the headquarters for the state Democratic Party and the state Republican Party both. By the time it was enlarged, it could hold as many as 300 guests. 
Here we see it completely enlarged in both uh, on the P Street side towards the west and the 11th Street side towards the south. This is probably about the time it could handle 300 guests. It was said in 1891 that 33,357 people signed the guest register uh, and stayed at least an hour or two, um, if not all overnight during that time. The building was ultimately purchased by a friend in Omaha, but not until the intersection had become paved. And it was one of the first areas in Lincoln to become paved. Uh, and in 1886-1887, the city council sent a, sort of an exploratory group around cities in the Midwest to see what we should pave with. Uh, obviously, most of the things would not be applicable. Uh, concrete, for example, or macadam asphalt wasn't available. But one of the things they discovered was in Kansas City, they'd been experimenting with uh, cedar blocks. And if you think of a cedar block as being about the size of a large paving brick, what they did was they laid sand, then they laid the brick on top of the sand, and then they swept sand into it, just as we would make a brick patio today. Now, the, the cedar blocks had a lot of advantages. And maybe the two biggest advantages were, one, cedar did not rot, like uh, another wood would have. And secondarily, if you think of most of the wagons that were going, being employed in Lincoln at that time, or any other city, they had a steel rimmed tire. And as you would get a lot of steel rimmed tires going over, say, a brick surface or stone surface, it would pr produce a cacophony. But the cedar blocks were relatively quiet. So we're going to, in the summer of 1887, buy 80 train car loads full of square cedar fence posts, which were then cut up into reasonable size lengths, probably, you know, 18 inches, something like that, laid up in the sand. Uh, and it was a good but temporary surface. And the reason it was temporary was because occasionally in Lincoln, uh, before global warming, it would rain. And now this area down there, because of these springs constantly pumping up water, that sand would remain moist, which was not necessarily a deterrent because they said the cedar blocks wouldn't rot that quickly. But unfortunately, because the sand was already moist, when it rained, it was saturated. And what happened was the cedar blocks would begin to float. And one of the city officials said that he and the other people in his command got tired of chasing the pavement because what it did was it would float, go around to P Street, which if you can remember it even now has quite a dip down to Salt Creek. So they would chase the pavement down clear into Salt Creek and have to bring it back. So it was not a very good method of paving at that point in time. Um, Long about the first part of the 20th century, it's purchased by Eugene Epley. He's also going to buy a couple of other hotels in the city of Lincoln, uh, including the Lindell, or Lindell. And he will, shortly after he buys it, discover that something's still happening here. And I'm not sure whether this is a settling of the building because of this moisture underneath it. But at any rate, the southeast corner of the building collapses uh, and falls in. So his plan is to simply remove the hotel and build again. I'm not sure whether that building on the corner is the one that's still there, do you know it? Which is uh, Cecil Stewart's house, the typewriter building, but I think it might be uh, Nebraska Typewriter Company or something like that, which he's completely remodeled as a townhouse. So that would make it, you could date the picture by that. This Epley replaces the uh, old hotel variously called the Commercial House and the Douglas House Hotel with the Capitol Hotel we see here under construction <clears throat> and here in completion. And of course this building still stands and later uh, it will become the downtown YMCA. Addition will be built to the west for a running track and swimming pool. Then about 1983 it will be converted to Georgian Place which is at least partially apartments, maybe partially condominiums. I don't know how it ultimately came out. So that building still stands, and we can see in the background uh, the old city hall building as well. One of the things that any city needed desperately in order to be successful would be a source of fresh water. And by the 1870s, Lincoln's population was over 2,000, and it had a problem, and that is fresh water. Most of the water, or in fact, most all of the drinking water, certainly, was produced by a series of what we think was no more than about half a dozen windmills. 
Uh, there was a windmill on the university campus. There was a windmill relatively close to the middle of the block, which now houses the mill, coffee shop, and Barry's Bar. Uh, roughly cl more closer to Barry's Bar because as the hotel is built around it, we find that well uh, still exists and the hotel is going to use that water. But that's where our fresh water comes from. We don't know exactly how many there were. We think there were at least six, and some places say there may be as many as, uh, many as a dozen uh, furnishing potable water. But at this point in time, we find that they've nearly reached their capacity. And so a letter in 1871 to the Lincoln Daily State Journal urges that the city of Lincoln do something to provide a better source of water, particularly they're thinking of not just potable water, but also as a means of putting out fires. We had no uh, system of pipes underground or anything else. So he suggested uh, that the city build a series of under underground cisterns. And we talked about those cisterns a little bit last week when we talked about the city of Lincoln currency, uh, which was initially, that's one of the things we thought they were going to finance was the production of these underground cisterns. Um, he suggested that, and he suggested for the well be sunk in the middle of Market Square, in other words, 9th, 10th OP, uh, to supply this water. Nothing came of the project initially, but finally in November of 1871, the city council voted what was at that time a pretty good chunk of money, $20,000, uh, to sink a well. Uh, then January of the next year, just a couple months later, a man by the name of John Eaton was hired to sink a well, uh, which he began in early April. Uh, interestingly enough, Mr. Eaton also kept a very concise little leather pocket diary of his day-by-day, week-by-week drilling which is in the State Historical Society archives and uh, is interesting reading at that. Uh, he started in April, but within days he had to quit because he discovered he didn't have heavy enough equipment. Uh, so it was actually not until May that he really got started and was able to dig far enough that he penetrated what he called a three foot thick layer of blue magnesia limestone and struck clear water. And we know that that stream of water which he connected with was probably the same one that the windmills were pumping out of because there is a strata, at least there was, a strata of about a foot thick of clear water which was glacial water which runs from clear north of Lincoln out to oh around not Sprague Martell but maybe out Denton Way something like that uh, which is still there, uh, glacial water. Um, and that might well have been where he stopped with his well, but he was looking for more than just water. He was looking for clear water, but he was also looking for an artesian flow because he didn't want to have to pump that water. So instead of stopping there, uh, he continued uh, to dig until he got down to approximately 100 feet when he discovered small particles of findings, we'll call them, of gold. And although he thought that gold was of a payable quality, by sending to the U.S. assay office in Denver for help, uh, we discovered that that gold is considered to be an anomaly and that there was no more gold and that it was very, very minute in quantity, so he continued to dig. Um, by June 30th, he uh, hit salt water. Uh, and that salt water was from the old inland lake, which, of course, the lake bed which Lincoln is sitting in. But he continued again further uh, hoping against hope to get clear water or an artesian flow. But by October the 15th, they had literally reached the end of their uh, drilling capacity, and they struck salt water. Uh, the salt water, however, was an artesian flow. Terrible picture, but a picture of the head of the water which came up through that pipe in an artesian flow. If you can use your imagination, you can see that it was probably about a six inch head of water throwing it pretty well out of the ground. Uh, it was not potable. However, it was said, and I've heard it said again since, that salt water, brine, is better for putting out fires than clear water. What the reason for that would be might be the fact that one, it doesn't freeze in the wintertime when you need to put out fires. And maybe, I don't know, but maybe it would cling to wood surfaces. I'm looking out for somebody to confirm or deny. Uh, so we'll just assume that one or both of those were the reasons that they decided that we'll complete the well at that, at that level and cap it. Besides, they've reached as far as they can drill. So now the block that we're talking about in 1873 
will ultimately become, of course, the site of the old post office. Um, but several things are going to happen in there. As the water is found useful to other people, the federal government issues in 1879 and 1880 licenses to hotels uh, nearby to pipe that water off and establish baths. Uh, these baths, the most prominent one was at the Douglas Commercial House Hotel, uh, and a man by the name of Dr. C. E. Strasberger, who listed himself as an electrician and professor of hydrology. I'm sure he was not using electrician the way we would think of it. Uh, professor of hydrology, and he advertised Turkish, Russian, electric, sulfur, and plain baths. And in fact, we've, we've got a sign of his on the side of a building that, at uh, uh, Tentano talking about this. And I've often wondered if you wouldn't have to be rather careful about an electric bath. I'm not sure. You might find yourself zinc coated. I'm not sure. Well. About a year later, Dr. Strasburg uh, started his own separate bath in the Union Block uh, in what he called the Lincoln Mineral Water Cure Institution. Uh, and at the same time, a stone well or fountain will be erected above the well head. And the popular belief is that it will cure pneumonia, torpid fever, rheumatism, and nervous prostration, and probably fallen arches, if you look carefully. So uh, we're going to see the post office federal building built up around that as we move on. Now this picture is taken over that market square block, which if you remember back 12 sessions ago, I think, we talked about being set aside by the state of Nebraska and given to the city of Lincoln as a market square, 9th, 10th OP. So there is nothing on that block particularly, and we're standing probably on top of the Atwood Hotel, which was the remnant of the old Methodist Protestant female seminary building, which just stood north of the northeast corner of 9th and P. Okay, probably standing on that. We're looking towards the south, uh, and we can see buildings along O Street, right to left from 9th to 10th. Well, one of the interesting buildings that's along in there is one which is called and we'll look at, I think, a closer picture here. It's the two-story building, which has apparently a darker colored first floor. The second floor appears to be white, about the uh, fifth building in, uh, which was called City Hall. And for years, I mistakenly thought that that meant it was the City Hall. But no, not in fact. Uh, we're going to build a City Hall across the street. But that building uh, is a hall, um, like this is a hall, or a Masonic Hall, or any kind of hall where you would have maybe stage plays or meetings, graduations, and so forth. Uh, two years before what we call Old City Hall was built, um, probably about 1879, 1877, 1878, somewhere in there, Fred Schmidt built that two-story masonry building on the south side of O Street. Uh, it's three floors tall, but it appears to be two stories tall. The upper floor was designated as City Hall. Actually, the, it's a two-story, two a very tall second story. Claimed to have a seating capacity of 1,000 people, and it was used for all sorts of public gatherings and purposes. In other words, it wasn't the City Hall or the City Hall. It was the City Hall, if you will. Um, the ground floor was divided up into retail establishments, hardware stores, farm implement dealers, and others through the years. Uh, and the building is added on to in the back several times as we watch the Sanborns maps, um, one story and two story additions onto the back. By 1889, it was called the People's Theater, which makes it easier to understand than the City Hall. And the street level was converted to a dry goods store called Schmidt's Dry Goods. And then in 1891, uh, both halves of the ground floor had been extended all the way back to the alley to the south. And the upper floor was noted as being buggy storage, uh, while the dry goods business carried on below. Then in the 20s, it became the Grand Leader Department Store, later becoming the Grand Leader and Simon Galter's Men's Furnishing Store. Uh, about 1950, it became on the upper floor the American Lightning Rod Company. I don't know whether they were manufacturing up there, storing, or whether they had offices. Then. It was listed by 1966 as vacant, and in 1970 it became the adult bookstore, which we all 
no one remember, I'm sure, because on December the 12th of 2010, the building was completely destroyed by fire, uh, caused the closing of that side of O Street for it seemed like years, but it was actually just months. Uh, but at that point in time, we discovered inside the building, those two floors on the top were literally still intact, not being used by anybody. Um, just another picture of the same building. And by now we can see on the corner, uh, the extant building is still there. This is a drawing, 1913, I guess, Ed, when they uh, converted and redid the front of the building, really making it read as a three-story building, but in fact, it is still just a two-story building. And then it's the Grand Leader Department Store. And then I'm not sure whether we have pictures of the fire, but there, yeah, it, this is from the backside. It really took out the building completely and then ultimately so destroyed the foundation to the building to the west, it also had to be torn down. So now we have that tooth in downtown Lincoln, which hopefully will become something. I guess there's talk of making a park of it, at least temporarily. In late 1872, 1873, uh, the federal government decided that the city of Lincoln probably was truly not going to blow away in a cloud of dust. Uh, and they sent an investigating committee to look at possible sites in Lincoln for building a federal courthouse, U.S. post office, and U.S. customs house. Now, Block 43, again, that's the Market Square block. Block 43 was empty. It had no buildings on it. It had had a building called Squire Blazier's Meat Market, but that was going to be moved off. Primarily, it was simply used as a market square or farmer's market, something like that we would think of it. Also, for a time, it became the site where if you were going through Lincoln and wanted to camp overnight, that was the city campgrounds as well. Uh, so it had become uh, a site where land sharks, gamblers, profiteers, and others also occupied as well as the farmer's market. But the, but the federal examining uh, committee, if you will, liked that block for several reasons. One, they said that by standing in the middle of it, they could see the rim of the prairie in all four directions. I don't know whether that's where Best Street or Aldridge got the line or not, but um, the reason being, of course, at that time the block had not been cut down to its present level, so it was a prominence. Secondarily, there were no tall buildings. Uh, probably a two-story building was about it, so they could see around them. And it was unoccupied, so they thought this would be the obvious site for our first permanent U.S. post office. Up until then, post office had moved quite regularly uh, between houses and kitchens and rented rooms, storefronts, and so forth. Um, but there was a flaw because this property, which the federal government wanted, was not only just in the hands of the city of Lincoln, who was most eager to give it or sell it to the federal government, but because it had been given to the city by the state of Nebraska in 1867 as part of the Capital Commission's charge, the city legally felt that they needed to get the permission of the state in order to transfer the property. So they went to the legislature, and the legislature quickly acquiesced and agreed to let them sell the property, provided that they establish a new uh, farmer's market or market area. And by looking at the early maps at that time, we can see there is another block of empty land uh, to the north, which is now the block which houses the uh, Journal Star Printing Company, not the Journal Star newspaper, but the printing uh, across the street to the north, where later we'll have the Central Fire Department, Police Department, County uh, Health Department. That block was empty. It's noted on maps as either being the historical block or the State Historical Society block. Uh, it was set aside initially for the use of the State Historical Society, but that time it had not been organized to the point where they needed it. And at that point in time, the City of Lincoln Legal Department probably stubs its toe. Uh, they just simply move into that lot and take it over and make a marker, uh, market square out of it. And this is going to come back to haunt them a little bit later on because they're going to have to purchase land uh, to give to the State Historical Society, make up for that block, which they have literally literally taken by eminent domain, but you can't do that against the state of Nebraska very easily. So at any rate, 
That block is uh, determined to be the block. The city of Lincoln contracts with the federal government offering them $1 and other valuable considerations for the exchange of that block with the proviso that it always be used for municipal purposes. If it ceases being used for municipal purposes, it will revert to the federal government, something which is kind of interesting to uh, watch. Um, and on April 1 of that year, the mayor of the city of Lincoln, John Gosper, transfers uh, by quick quit claim deed for one dollar that block of land. At that point in time, the supervising architect is a man by the name of Colonel A.B. Mullet for the federal government, uh, and it was assumed that he would visit the site, and hopefully that he would approve building a proper stone and masonry building to cost at least $180,000. That's pretty pie in the sky. Uh, and in fact, the project was championed by U.S. Senator P.W. Hitchcock of Omaha, so it thought it had an inside track, but by June of 1873, Mullet still had not gotten to Lincoln. Uh, and at that point in time, Charles Gere, uh, who was secretary to the Post Office Location Board, um, wrote to the Secretary of Treasury, uh, feeling that the project should be pushed through Congress. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> um, Gere also alluded uh, that to the fact that Nebraska's lack of national political influence might be one of the reasons they're slowing their action, but who knows. Well, Mullet finally did come to Lincoln, May 22nd of 1874. He also inspected the Guire Brothers stone quarries, which were fairly near Oreopolis, fairly near Plattsmouth, which had the advantage of being on the Atchison, Nebraska Railroad near the Platte River. That will be part of the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad, ultimately. Uh, and Gear then editorialized, perhaps pandering a bit to Mr. Mullet, uh, saying that Mullet would bring order out of chaos and save the country from wasting the public monies upon ill-planned and mongrel monuments to architectural imbecility. That's, that's, that's that. You might want to remember that. Um, Mullet ignored the original appropriation for a two-story building and planned then on a more elaborate four-story building. This is the stone yard, and it's a teeny bit unclear to me exactly where it was located. And I'm not sure, Ed, whether it was located about where the creamery building is today, but don't know for sure. North, northeast corner of 7th and L. 7th and L, the northeast corner. Oh, okay, clear over there, quite a bit further to the south. Uh, at any rate, supposedly standing in the doorway over there, when an almost invisible was Mr. Tyler, who will get the... Uh, job of the stone masonry. So we're bringing the stone up from the Guire Brothers quarries, depositing it here, probably cutting it some, sizing it, and getting ready to get to move up to the square block. One of the first pictures we have of the actual construction of the building is shown here. Excavations were begun May 26th of 1874 uh, amid great complaints from the contractor that the ground was very difficult to break perhaps he thought because of the pounding down of all of the animals and uh, camping equipment and so forth have been on there, who knows. Uh, then Mullet resigned his post uh, in January of 1875 and as architect was replaced by William Appleton Potter. He was uh, fortunately, I guess, a good friend of Senator Thayer's, uh, so they thought that would ensure his continuing to build the more favorable building. But Potter first thought that returning to the two-story Mansard Rip building made more sense, but both U.S. Senators Hitchcock and Thayer uh, said that they would not settle for a cheap finish. So, ultimately we're going to get it. So materials come in. We begin to build the uh, foundation work of the, of the extent building. We're looking at the uncompleted First National Bank building, which stood on the southeast corner of 10th and O Streets. On the right-hand side, uh, we see buildings which will be replaced by the terminal building. Um, maybe one of the most interesting ones is David May, the clothiers building, because David May is the one who, in our last session, purchased all of those City of Lincoln notes that were extant and rubber-stamped his name on them as an advertisement. Uh, but David May pops up again, uh, particularly when we get even out to the uh, history of College View. So an interesting guy. Looking between those two buildings, we could not see in the last picture, but here we see in a little bit later, obviously work on the foundation has stopped because it's winter, but we can see a couple of things more clearly. In this picture, we can see on the left, 
popping up out of the horizon, one of the probably six best pictures we have of the Capitol building. We don't have a lot of good early pictures of the Capitol building. Uh, on the left-hand side, the little three-bay building is the Sweet and Brock Bank building we talked about last time. Now the first National Bank building has been completed. Uh, we can also see by looking between the buildings towards the southeast, we can see a fire tower. Uh, this is where the bell hung behind the livery stable to call the volunteer fire department. And to the right of that is one of the few pictures we have at all of the first Methodist Protestant uh, church building, the first masonry church building to be built in the city of Lincoln, uh, later encompassed into the Baldwin Terrace. So we can see work has stopped, and we can see too, as we see in most of these pictures, that the farmers continue to use that block for a farmer's market um, and at a parking lot. Now we're standing probably back on top of the First National Bank building and we're looking towards the Northwest. And we can see running left and right in the picture, Ninth Street. We can see a windmill and that's the windmill which would ultimately be encompassed by the hotel which precedes Barry's Bar. So that would be in that block uh, where the mill is located today. Um, we now have a wall built along, particularly the O Street frontage of sort of a construction wall, and the foundation work is begin, beginning to come up out of the ground just a little bit. Um, in a way, my, one of my favorite pictures of the whole thing, uh, not because it really shows anything too interesting going on, uh, but we can see we can see the windmill blurring in the background because it's turning, of course, so it's roughly from the same vantage, perhaps a little bit lower. But this is a uh, wet glass, 8 by 10, probably glass negative. Uh, and what makes this picture interesting is right here on the fence is a sign, which in, by the time I get done copying it as a picture and then as a slide, and they reproduce it on the screen. It just looks like a white piece of paper. But actually, we can look at that original uh, negative, and we can see that in the middle of it, there is a device of a black American, or an eagle, let's say. And it's saying Centennial. Can't remember if that's below it or above it. But it's announcing that the following 4th of July, the United States will be 100 years old. And we sit in the room and remember the bicentennial. So. I think it's interesting there that we can go to a building, lay our hand on the stonework and say that building uh, was here when the United States was 100 years old, still there when the United States is 200 years old. So the building is going up again. We can see the stonework has progressed up maybe five feet above the foundation stage. One of the things the contractor completely or continually, I should say, argues about is the fact that the farmers want to continue to use that building block as a parking lot. They don't want to, you know, it's two blocks over to that. It's just like Gateway, you know, if you can't park right at the front door, you just keep driving around. And the same was true then. They didn't want to walk, they didn't want to walk two blocks over there. We can also see the top on the right-hand side of the picture, uh, top floor of the three-story Baker Hardware Building, which stood on the northwest corner of 9th and O. The building continues to go up in this picture. Now the uh, building is completed. Uh, we can look again towards the southeast. Uh, we can again see the Capitol building is still there, the first Capitol, the first National Bank. Uh, we can see the Methodist Protestant Church, again the Sweet and Brock Bank building in one of its many, many uh, new facades. And we can see the building is completed, not yet moved into, but we can also see that the farmers have not given up on using it for a parking lot. Considerably later, uh, things have begun to develop. We're probably into the 1880s, 1890s in this picture. Again, looking, looking in the same direction towards the southeast. But now, guess what? We have the second Capitol building in place. Uh, we still have the First National Bank building. We have the Swedenbrock Bank building still there, but yet a new facade on it. And now it, gives a, it reads as if it's three separate buildings, which we know that it is not. We can also see the fountain that has been erected over that well, which almost in the dead center of the block we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, 
We can also see that a park is beginning to develop on the north half of that block. A gazebo or a bandstand has been erected and trees are starting to grow up. And as we look at this picture again, uh, much later when we get to the, see the construction of the Lincoln Hotel, we can look across that park, which is really a rather attractive little downtown park, uh, looking at the uh, Lincoln Hotel, uh, and you can almost believe it's Central Park looking across towards one of the buildings there. So now the building is being used uh, and in full use. A picture taken from the dome, or not the dome, but the cupola of the University of Nebraska. So we're looking down 11th Street. It's a two-paneled picture. Uh, when I, I bought this picture for a dime, probably back in the 1960s, because nobody knew what it was. But what it is, is looking almost south, south, southwest from the university. Uh, and the reason I included it here is because right dead in the middle of the picture is that US post office. Uh, and that U.S. Post Office is a commanding building. It's very, very large. And until we get around and look at, say, maybe the Capitol building, this is the most imposing building in the city of Lincoln. Nothing else really comes up in that view at all to obscure it. By 1904, uh, construction has begun on what will be the eastern one-third of the new Post Office building. Uh, and this part of the building uh, is actually, although it sort of belies itself in looking at it, supposedly has 50% more square footage or usable square footage than the old uh, building did. And at this point in time, the old building will be sold by the federal government to the city of Lincoln for uh, $50,000 or $55,000, I forget which, for use as a city hall. Uh, and of course, again, uh, when it's sold for use as a city hall, the city has to agree that it is, if it, that building is never used for municipal purposes, it will revert to the federal government. Uh, something which may still be true, but I think it'd be hard to enforce, I don't know. At any rate, uh, we now have uh, the old post office sold, the new one being moved into. Um, and I think the next picture is the back side of that building. This would be the principal facade. Yeah, this is the back side of the building. We're looking through, again, towards the southeast. We can see uh, the old post office, now the city hall building on the left, the first third of the new post office, which we call the old post office, very interestingly, and the new present First National Bank building between the two buildings. We can also see the well, uh, wellhead, the fountain that's there, and we can see people probably stopping there to get a drink of water. And I, many, many years ago, it's been now, but I talked to an elderly lady who said that when she came to Lincoln with her father, one of the first things they always did, they came from the farm and they stopped there and they were each given a tin cup and told to drink a tin cup full of that salty, brackish water because it was good for you. <laughs> Uh, and of course, it was raising your blood pressure, hardening your arteries, and doing, make, probably rusting from the inside out. But nonetheless, people con continued to think forever, literally, that that water was truly good for you. This is the back of that building. Uh, that is Mr. Melnick, who I believe was the chief of police at, or fire department, I can't remember which, in the wagon right there. And of course, the loading and loading for the post office was at that time on the west elevation of the building. And again, the First National Bank building in the background. A really rather tattered example of a postcard, but it is here for a purpose, and that is to show you it's difficult for us, I think, to look at that current old post office building and think of it not as a unit, but as something which was built in thirds. And this very clearly taken looking towards the Northwest shows us that it was a freestanding and completely separate building. Uh, and we're looking here probably about 1910, something like that, because we have lots of, lots of uh, action from the uh, streetcars in there as well. This is the interior of the first portion of the building as it appears later on, but it was really rather spectacular. Uh, black, I don't know, would that be onyx, Bob? I'm not sure what it would be. Black marble, black at any rate, uh, terrazzo floors, uh, and that beautiful coffered ceiling. It's all still there as far as I know. It was for many, many decades covered up with plywood and drywall, 
uh, when the city used it, but that's a good way of preserving things. And now uh, this easternmost third of the building kind of, if you squint, <laughs> can still see this in it today. This is the courtroom uh, on the upper floors. We're looking towards the south. Uh, this picture was taken probably about 1918, 1920 by a man by the name of Wells, W-E-L-L-E-S, who worked for the post office department and took a lot of pictures right around in this block, fortunately, uh, because when they went to um, restore the building, one of the things that they were looking for was what did that chandelier look like? And that first third of the building was built at a time uh, when public buildings, and in fact many larger houses, had not just electricity laid in, but also still had gas lighting laid in. And so this is a fixture uh, which would be gas up and electricity down. Uh, and there was sort of a prevailing opinion among some at that time that you needed both because they really were skeptical of electricity and thought it might be a passing fad uh, and that we might have to go back to using gas lights. So if you go into a say a dining room or a living room, a house built in the same period, quite often if you tear into the ceiling or even the walls, you will find copper tubing, uh, which ran to gas lights either on the wall sconces or in the central. Uh, so it was, it was rather common and went on probably, I don't know, maybe into the 20s, something like that, maybe not quite that far. Uh, the other thing we notice in this picture is that the windows on the east side of the room are open. Later on, they will be boarded up. Uh, they still read as windows from the outside, but they will be completely covered with wood. Now, along about uh, World War I time, we're going to expand that building. We're going to tear off the west elevation of the building, which we're doing here, preparatory to building the middle third of the building, increasing it again by a third. Here we are looking across uh, ninth, excuse me, P Street towards the north. Uh, we can see buildings, which many of which stood until the time the journal... Uh, tore them down to build their first edition, uh, and then now there's a little bank on the corner, which was also a bus station. But at this point in time, we see a building being built literally still using shovels and picks and wheelbarrows and horsepower and mule power and so forth. The second third of the building uh, is completed, and we actually do have photographs of it, but I, I picked this hand-colored postcard because it more clearly delineates the building as two separate construction uh, periods, although it reads almost perfectly from the exterior or the north elevation as one building. We can see the Lincoln Hotel also on the right in this building. We might add also that it, as they build to the west, the first portion has that beautiful uh, terrazzo tile floor. They're going to continue the terrazzo tile floor, but not the coffered ceilings, not the uh, extravagant amount of oak woodwork in any of the floors of the building as they march towards the final third when there is almost no use of coffered ceilings or much reduced use of uh, oak in the floor, or excuse me, the doors and mop boards and so forth. This is a rather poor picture, unfortunately, but it's taken from the balcony uh, or fire escape, if you will, of the old Lincoln Hotel looking across the construction site towards the east. And we can see here that the old fountain, which had originally been located pretty much in the middle of the block, with the construction of the second third of the post office building, would cover that. So what they did was they piped the water from that wellhead to uh, the fountain, which has been moved literally to 9th Street, right across the street from the hotel. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time, but for various reasons, the flow of that, or the pressure behind that artesian flow has reduced considerably. Uh, artesian flows will subside, will abate, will increase as rainwater and so forth refill. Uh, but as we pave over downtown Lincoln, most of these artesian wells, springs will dry up. And that, I think, is probably what's happened here because the pressure and the water flow from the original wellhead is no longer really sufficient to move that salt water from the original wellhead to the fountain. 
So the fountain becomes a repository of rainwater and leaves, and it becomes rather unattractive. At that point, uh, the engineering department at the University of Nebraska steps in and says they're going to try and figure out a way to uh, introduce pumps to move that salt water over. But if you know about pumping salt water, particularly at that time, uh, salt water is just almost like pumping acid, and the pumps don't like it, and they never were successful in moving water to that pump or to that fountainhead. Here's another picture. Uh, this one is taken 30-something. Uh, I can't quite read it. 33, maybe. Uh, we're looking again from the hotel vantage, now looking across the site towards the northeast. We can see several interesting things. We can see, first of all, the journal hasn't torn down the other or east half of that block. We can see the old post office city hall. We can see test drillings occurring in the property there for the final third of the building uh, to complete it as one unit. But the other thing we can see, if we count the floors in the building from the interior, we have one, two, three, four, and five. Whereas if we count the floors from the north elevation of the building, we only count four. So we have windows facing into the courtyard from an upper floor of the building, which is never completely utilized, which we'll see a little more in just a minute. So here we are in the 30s planning that last portion. Here we are looking at the construction from the alley, looking towards the north. That's the old Journal Star printing building, which was on the corner until the 50s, when the present building was built. And we can see the basement has, has being built, and we're bringing the building up above ground. Steel work is now going into the structure. We're looking back towards the southeast in this picture. And now we can see the building again. This is the south elevation or the alley elevation. We can see the building rising up above the ground. Now the upper floor of that building, uh, when they left that building and moved down to the new post office uh, in the Haymarket building, which we're now going to have to start calling the old post office building. What are we going to call this? The old post office, the old, old post office, and the oldest post office building, I guess. But up on that top floor, at that point in time, um, I would take tours up there, and there we still had gas and electricity furnished to the building. There was no mantle or anything on it, so you couldn't turn it on, and probably it's been cut off. We don't know that. This is in that upper floor. Down in the basement, now we have removed the fountain completely. We've covered it over. However, the wellhead is still there. And now, in this picture, just as the post office leaves the building, it is covered with a scrim of concrete so thin, in fact, that you can see an echo or a shadow of that manhole cover, which covers the uh, wellhead, which is still there. And in fact, at the point in time that the post office moved out, in talking to some of the carriers who worked there, they had sort of a ready room, lunch room down there over this area. And they said, still at that time, some of the postmen would go over during the lunch hour. And after they would finish lunch, they would open that valve and get a cup of that great salt water <laughs> to finish up their lunch with, and which may explain why none of them are left today. <laughs> So they're going to cover that over. And we're going to have uh, Omaha buyers as a new, t new what, Ed? New town, new force, new? New style. New style uh, from Omaha will acquire the building. Uh, it has since been acquired by a combination of an insurance company and something called Reinvesco. Uh, and they will sell the building. They will have purchased it as excess property from the federal government. And they will sell it to new style in Omaha. Uh, because we're literally out of town, or out of time, excuse me, I'd like to finish this next time uh, and see if there are any questions. In summary, is the proposal to turn that, those two buildings into the performing arts center? Yeah, Mr. Casper is asking about, am I familiar with the proposal? Yeah, Larry Anderson, I believe, uh, pro produced a idea and, in fact, some rough sketches of how we would bridge what we call the old post office and the old city hall together with a huge performing arts center. It was rather ambitious, and we do have those pictures or those drawings, uh, which, as far as I know, really never got beyond the concept stage. I think it was Larry Anderson that completely did that. Rather imaginative, I'll have to say, but it did not fly. Yeah. Could I refer to 
consist of the market square with the original grades? I mean, with the original Are there any photographs there? of the original market square with the original grade? The closest we have, Matt, is a picture which shows the north portion of the block still ex in, intact, let's say. And the 17 feet is what the contractor says. He lowered the grade of that block. And Ed, have you seen anything to disagree with that? In other words, if you come up from the old depot up P Street, we would have found that rise kept going and maybe as kind of a pinnacle there, I don't know. But the contractor says he removes, he lowers the grade 17, that's one seven feet to the present grade. It seems like a lot. And the only picture we have is one which shows a stack of earth, which it's difficult to uh, tell how deep it is, but it looks to be like maybe eight feet deep on the north east, no, northwest corner of the block. And that's all I've seen, and I'm not sure whether anybody else has seen anything other than that. Ed, do you know of any other photographs of that? Okay. Bob? Jay. Okay. Another question? Okay, I think we'll pick it up with this slide next time and complete the renovation as it exists now of what we call the old post office building. And I think that comes in December, does it not? Okay, great.